Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Taryn. I'm Renee, and I'm an alcoholic. And if you hear a little uh, ring, it's because it's my little timer so that I won't go over. Um, So tonight's topic, as uh, Taryn had mentioned, is why is it we take that one drink? So as it relates to the topic, I thought I would just give you a very brief background of, uh, from me, how it relates to the topic. When I first was separated from alcohol, it was uh, October 17th of 1986. And then close to five years of sobriety, I was one that took that one drink. And so I was, uh, by God's grace, separated from alcohol uh, once again on June the 11th of 1990. So let's go uh, to page 59, which I want to refer to the short versions of the step. And step one is going to be the step that addresses this topic. Um, But I want to introduce one, two, and three. On page 59, step one says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And that's the first half, dash, that our lives had become unmanageable the second half. And it refers to the problem and talks about the powerlessness. And step one in the big book is covered from the doctor's opinion to uh, about page 45 or so. And then step two is talking about the solution and it is referring to power that is our solution. And that is from page 45 to about 60. And then the suggested program of action is uh, step three through 12. And that would be the remaining pages. So with all those uh, put together, step one is covered in about 30 to 40% of those pages. And it's a very prevalent step. Uh, My sponsor and I spent a lot of time going through that step. Um, So let's get started. Uh, step one, let's go look at um, the doctor's opinion, okay? And this is a Dr. Silkworth, who was known as the little doctor who loved drunks. He treated over 41,000 patients with alcoholism. And he is uh, a doctor that had introduced uh, or conceptualized the idea that alcoholism is not just a mental illness like previous doctors. Uh, There were some in the past that had um, described it in pamphlets and essays, suggesting that it was just a mental illness. And that was even a step up from some other old beliefs that alcoholism was just something that we were possessed from something evil. So it's really come a, a long way. So when Dr. Silkworth put his statement in this book on the top of XXVIII, that first paragraph, he says we, and he's referring to the doctors that are in the medicine field at that time, late 30s, early 40s, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action or the effect of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation, which is just a big word, meaning it showed itself as an allergy. And an allergy is an abnormal reaction to a common substance. And in this case, it's alcohol. So what does that look like? Well, he says that is a phenomenon of craving that's limited to this class. What class? The chronic alcoholic. And never occurs in the average temperate drinker. When I looked at this, I know that I'm not an alcoholic because I drink. I drink because I'm an alcoholic. I have a reoccurring allergy that once I take a drink, I have an allergy. It creates that craving. And I heard a speaker once say it really well. It's very similar to the idea that our bodies crave oxygen, air. And the only reason I don't feel that craving is because it's getting satisfied. Every time I intake air, I'm I'm satisfying that crave. It has to have it. 
when I take a drink of alcohol and then stop abruptly, I'm going to go to extreme measures to get another drink because my body develops that craving and it absolutely, all bets are off, hats are down, I've got to have alcohol again. And as we go through this, this is something that I have to do self-diagnose. And as I went through this, it's important to remember I'm just as much of an alcoholic today as I was the day before I came into recovery and was separated from alcohol. That's a really important uh, part of my experience as well. So let's look at part of the mental uh, the mental aspect of this, okay? So let's go to page 20. And this is going to take us into the chapter, There is a Solution. And pages 20 through 24, uh, there's going to be quite a few parts in there that we're going to look at. So on page 20, all it's doing down at the bottom of that page, I'm just going to summarize that part, is that it will help us understand what the moderate and the hard drinker looks like. And uh, I needed to rule that out before I could really say, okay, yes, this is me. I am a chronic alcoholic, a real alcoholic. And the moderate drinker and the hard drinker, typically it says maybe with some difficulty, but they could actually stop drinking based on given good reasons or uh sufficient strong reasons like health or a loved one threatens to leave, uh, going to lose a position at a uh, promising job, and the list goes on. And these types of drinkers can eventually stop altogether. And I knew that I did not fall in that category. So as the paragraph starts on page 21, it says, but what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker, and he may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So control is just another way of saying regulating it, and that is something that has been from, that was uh, characterized my drinking from the very first time. And... Uh, with that in mind, it goes down that page, and to just for the um, restraint of time, I'll just kind of summarize that part, that it's talking about behavior patterns, and that it refers to kind of like a double life, that um, as an example, some real alcoholics would live that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, seldom mildly intoxicated, um, just insanely drunk when he's drunk, but you know, when he's not drunk, he may be one of the finest fellows that you know, um, but when he drinks, he can become very dangerously antisocial um, and yet be a well-balanced person concerning everything except liquor. And so as we go to page 22, it's continuing to refer to how he maintains that lifestyle with sedatives in between the sprees. And then the first paragraph, which is about halfway down, this is a very um, pertinent part of identifying being a real alcoholic. And see, my sponsor can't tell me that. You people can't tell me that. I've got to know, is this for me? And so it goes on, it says, this is by no means the comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as our behaviors uh, patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. And here's our question, it comes up, it says, why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters? And it's followed by perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. So this is a question that I've got to come to reconcile for myself. And so one has to do that for him or herself. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. 
We are not sure why, once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. But it goes on to say, we know that while the alcoholic keeps away from the drink, as he may do for months or years, like in my case, it was almost five years. And so I could really, really infiltrate this as it reads, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens, both bodily and mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. And so this becomes the question for me. The experience of an alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. So in going over this with a sponsor, I was able to actually turn this into a question. Did that experience abundantly show me, confirm that something happened to me after years of being separated from alcohol? Did something happen to me bodily and mentally? And there's no point in going on unless I can answer that with a clear yes or no. And it was abundantly confirmed for me, yes. So in the following paragraph, it is going to touch on where the problem really lies because we've talked about the powerlessness of the physical. So now we're going to kind of lean into that. What does that mental obsession look like? So it talks about these observations would be pointless and, uh, excuse me, academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. This is just pointing out the fact that if I could just say um, no, then there would not be a problem. And the concern here is there's, they're raising up the fact that there's something in my mind that continues to go to the drink. And it's going to go into depth in talking about that mental obsession, okay, which is just a persistent, disturbing preoccupation of an unreasonable idea that I can drink like other people without impunity. And it did not cross my mind when I had taken that first drink after being separated from alcohol for many years, that I would have any kind of recollection of what that pain, and, and we're going to get into that page where it talks about that, you know, that humiliation that I experienced from the last time. And many times in meetings, I've heard, just remember your last drunk and and put the plug in the jug and you won't, you know, you won't drink. And unfortunately for me, my memory is not that great. And, it, you know, like Teflon, it, you know, it just bounces right off. I don't, I do not retain things. <laughs> I write down many, many things if I want to remember them. But in respect to this, I could, it doesn't matter if I remember the last drunk. It's, I would just totally wipe out the, the concept that it was a painful experience, that it tore up relationships, that I lost jobs, that it, it was an inconvenience to the life that I was trying to live because it was overpowering at that point and running my life. So as we progress on, it's introducing the mental part. And when you go to the next paragraph, go to the seventh line down, and we're on page 23. It's um, the seventh line down, about halfway over. The sentence begins with, there is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but they often suspect they are down for the count. And then our following paragraph is what's going to really start helping me understand what a real alcoholic looks like. And here they're saying, the tragic truth, the very uh, last paragraph on that page the tragic truth is that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost control. And that is on the top of page 24. And this is where it's going to get kind of meaty. It's really showing us some information to help me understand my alcoholism. So like we mentioned, control is another way of saying regulate. And then the next paragraph uh it is an italicized to emphasize and re-emphasize. And this says, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscured, which is like a vague, is, you know, obscure is just referring to like a vague, uh, have lost the power of choice. 
Power meaning strength and choice is when you have two or more reasonable options. Okay, so we're going to look at that in a minute. Have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. This is a very um, important uh information, but it's also something I need to be able to see in my life. I can't just read it and learn it. This is something that either it's true in my life or it's not. So when I look at the idea of drinking as a choice, oh, today I choose not to drink. No, that's not really a realistic option for me in light of the havoc and the turmoil and um, the, literally punity, um, is that really a reasonable option? So I don't have choice there because in my case, it was not a reasonable option. So I relate to the having lost the power of choice. And so as we go through page 24, uh, it's going to talk about being beyond human aid. Um, I want to kind of jump a little bit um, for a little bit of the sake of time is jump into more about alcoholism, which is going to be um, page 30. Okay. So looking at the physical powerlessness and the mental powerlessness, page 30 helps me really look at that. What is that mental powerlessness? really about. And so on page 30, and go down about the sixth line of that first paragraph, the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. And then it confirms in the next paragraph, we've learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. And so this is presenting the concept that I have both. If I do have both, then I do have that self-diagnose of a real alcoholic, according to this big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is going into the mental obsession. Now, the mental obsession was something I thought meant I'm just constantly thinking about drinking. And what it refers to in my life is that it's a constant way of thinking. It's not that I think about the drink all the time, although that can happen. But what I was blind to, kind of like driving down the road and we got that little blind spot in the rear view mirror and we can't see it, right? But there's that one blind spot for me. And that's the part that I just, because I can't see it, it, well, then it must not be there. And then I'm quite likely to have a wreck if I try to change lanes and, and there is a car in that blind spot. And this is what happens. I have a blind spot when it comes to this. I needed to realize that the mental obsession condemns me to drink, okay? That I lack that proportion to think rationally about this when it comes to alcohol. And we're going to look at that where it talks about that on page 37 with a story about Jim. So let's go to, and we're still in more about alcoholism, but let's talk about this guy named Jim who, um, they, you know, used a, uh, they made up this name for a guy that's named uh, uh, Ralph Furlong. And so Jim, on page 36, just to give you his background, he was a relapser for six times. And so when he had gone back out, our co-founders wanted to know what happened. So he narrates his story on page 36 it starts at the second line at the very top. 
I came to work on Tuesday morning. I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. I had a few words with the boss, but nothing serious. Then I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. So right there, it infers he's a car salesman. He once owned an establishment of some sort and now has stepped down to become the salesman versus the owner. And then it goes on to talk about on the way, I felt hungry. So I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. I had no intention of drinking. I just thought I would get a sandwich. I also had the notion that I might find a customer for a car at this place, which was familiar for I had been going to it for years. So he's mentioned that it does have a bar, but he's not going to drink. And non-alcoholics typically might take note that there's one there, but to make a commitment that, oh, I'm not going to drink, kind of an interesting concept that he's bringing up. And the fact that he was irritated, this is a state of mind when I'm not drinking. And Dr. Silkworth refers to irritable, restless, and discontent. And this gentleman had mentioned that he felt irritated. So as he goes on, the following line in that paragraph, I had eaten there many times during the months I was sober. So it shows that he had been not drinking. I sat down at a table and ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. Sounds pretty ordinary. I'm assuming it's lunchtime. Says still no thought of drinking, but he must have thought about it if he brought it up again. I don't know. I can't really say that, but I just noticed that pattern that he's thinking it because he brought it up twice. I ordered another sandwich and decided to have another glass of milk. And even that I kind of found peculiar because typically I don't order two lunches um, and, and another whole glass of something to drink and an entire another lunch. So maybe he was a big guy or something or very hungry or hadn't eaten in you know a long while. So those are always possibilities. But as I said, here's the italicized to emphasize and reemphasize. It says suddenly, okay, it's very quickly come to his mind that, the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. I ordered the whiskey and poured it into my milk. I vaguely, there's that word vaguely, sensed I was not being any too smart. That's kind of a metacognitive way of approach. He's thinking about his thinking. He's actually processing the fact that, well, I don't recall that I wasn't being too smart about this. And then he goes on, comma, but felt reassured. As a matter of fact, he was reassured. I was talking, excuse me, taking the whiskey on, again, a full stomach. The experiment, and I, I find this a very interesting choice of words. Experiment is when I'm trying to rule something out, and I'm actually doing something with intentions. And so here, it kind of goes against the sudden, the suddenly thing because now it's becoming an, an experiment. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. And this reminds me of when I did take that drink. That's when I became what I felt functional. I, you know, I just felt like I wasn't irritable, restless and discontent. And so that's, kind of interesting that I needed once I took that drink I needed it and the and the topic is about well why do we take that first drink well here we're seeing a mental twist and that we had read earlier that that is the problem is in the mind of the alcoholic okay once I decided and knew and diagnosed myself as a true alcoholic then I had to look at okay if it's not just physical then I've got to look at what's going on between my ears. Well, this guy, he's telling it, but then it goes to third party. And now they're telling, uh, kind of uh, reviewing what they heard. And this is what they said. Thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. Here was the threat of commitment, the loss of a family and position, his job. 
to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering which drinking always caused him. He was a six-time relapser. And because he didn't say these things, it's interesting. And they just showed me. When he narrated his story, he said nothing about those things, did he? It is something that they could see. But even after not drinking, and now he's reviewing it in the past, telling them this is what had happened. And they are the ones pointing out the fact that he didn't even bring up the fact that it concerned him, the commitment that he had made to his family, the risk he took from doing it during work hours and and all kinds of things, right? And so here's the italicized to emphasize and reemphasize. He had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic, yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in favor of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with milk. So the next statement is exactly what is in my life true. Okay, so this is a question that we could look at, but right now the way it's put, it's in a statement form. It says, whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight, like with everything else, showing to work on time, paying my bills, loving my family, taking care of the animals I have, and just on and on and on. But the lack of proportion of the ability to think straight concerning the alcohol be called anything else. And so it showed on the previous page, 36, that mental twist. I mean, we are seeing it right here. What an example. It is like out there. He hadn't even discussed that this was a threat to his livelihood his family. I mean, it's it's incredible. And he even ended up with the fact that, well, the experiment went so well, he ordered another one. And so this is what I experienced when I did pick up that drink. And I had a job and uh, well paid at the time and had good reasons to stay sober, to stay separated from alcohol. But that's my uh, untreated alcoholism. Now, do, am I vulnerable every time I leave the house and now I'm just going to automatically give up because I'm just going to drink? No. I'm here to say that with that in mind, I know I'm a real alcoholic, but I've had a spiritual malady that I addressed and it's coupled with the mental obsession that we talked about and the physical allergy, okay? And so on page 44, it suggests that if that be the case for me, I may be suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And so, because I could not bring with sufficient force to my my mind, my memory of that last pain and suffering and humiliation that I experienced, which uh, my experience was like almost five years prior to that, then I had no defense against that first drink. And that's why I took the drink, because I'm a real alcoholic, okay? And I'm not an alcoholic because I drank. I drank because I am an alcoholic. And I know that's kind of a subtle difference there, but it's a truth in my life that I have to be in check with with this step. And that's why it is so important to be really reflecting and applying this into my experience, my life. So with untreated alcoholism, I was doing meetings and I was doing service work, but I was not working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the suggested program, a spiritual program of action. And so today, you know, it is a privilege to be separated from alcohol, and I work these steps because of that. And I work with others and do service work and work the steps with others and go to meetings for a different reason. It's because I have been separated, and I have experienced spiritual awakenings throughout this last year even, just going through them again. And so 
having said that, it's, it is truly a privilege not only to be separated from alcohol, but to be able to do all three sides of that triangle that we bring up quite often in meetings. So into uh, page 84, and I want to, I've got a little bit of time left, which is good. Um, page 84, I wanted to mention, because step one talks about the problem, and I don't want to leave this with just the problem laid out. Of course, step two is talking about the solution, which is power. And to know this, that when I get to page between uh, step three, really, when I actually begin to make that decision and move forward with a certain position that I agree to take with the, a higher power of some sort, that on page 84 and 85, the bottom paragraph, it says, and, and that is referring to, it's a connector referring to, in addition to the previous paragraph. So it says, and we have ceased fighting, and I'm on the bottom of page 84, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. And that was something I was fighting. So that's included in this. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. The sanity for me is not that I recoiled. That's a result of being returned to sanity. I react that way because I have been returned to sanity by God's grace. The sanity is recognized for me as recognizing the hot flame. That blind spot I talked about, seeing the hot flame, seeing it for what it is. The delusion is what rests inside of my mind as a real alcoholic. And that is believing the lie that I can drink like others, and I cannot. But now it says we react sanely and normally, and we will find that this happened has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. And miracle is just an event that manifests as a work of God, as a higher power. So I must have this higher power in my life. And it talks about that on page 45 and then gets into, you know, it touches on the unmanageability aspect of step one and then gets into our second step in that. Can we just believe or are we even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? And that's almost a no-brainer for me. I can look around and see many, many evidences of a higher power. And we don't have to call it God. And it said on the bottom of that page, um, I believe 45, where it talks about that's comforting to know that we can start on such a simple level like that. And I have found that my higher power, who I call God, but don't let that prejudice you in any way you know that this is up to you as far as where and how you have that higher power in your life uh but i have found him in the last place i looked which was that fourth and fifth step six and seven tells me how to handle that information and then eight and nine also helps me with what i do with that information uh, because I've recovered from alcoholism. That's the hope. And I don't want, like I said, want to leave it on just the problem, you know, with step one, but that when people come in, not just the brand new, but everyone that's in a meeting may be in that desperate place of needing that higher power by which we could live. It's not discriminating against how much time or little you know, a lot of time or little time. It's not saying, well, only if you have 60 days do you need this higher power. And we're only going to speak to those that have 60 days. No, this is about one alcoholic working with another alcoholic. And um, the forward to the second edition that I'm going to uh, put closure on this, um, it seems to my mind, I didn't even have that in my notes, but when it comes to my mind, I have to believe that might be God working. Um, so. Yep, on uh, the forward to the second edition, if you flip it over one page to XVII, uh, 
it's referring to when Dr. Bob and Bill W. had worked together. And it says it indicated that strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, was vital, like vital signs that's necessary to live. You've got your heartbeat and your blood flow and this. And they're saying that working one alcoholic with another was vital, okay, necessary for life, to permanent recovery. That's a big deal for me. Oh, there goes my my little timer. So perfect timing. So that's all I have. And I, I thank you so much. It's been a huge privilege to be here and to bring the topic tonight. Sharon, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, did you listen to you? So the first question there, Renee, thanks so much for that is, am I an alcoholic? If I don't drink anymore, and I'm recovered? Well, my first thought is that something that needs to be reviewed and reflected on individually. And to help with that, I can describe what the physical allergy looks like and how it manifests into a craving, a phenomenon, a craving. And if you have that, in addition to that mental obsession, which is that ongoing way of thought. It's a persistent, disturbing preoccupation, okay, that I can drink like other people without impunity. And so dash that second half of the step, that my life had become unmanageable. And Dr. Silkworth helped on, uh, me understand that the state of mind that I have is that irritable, restless, and discontent unless I take another drink to calm that down and get, you know, and I believe that's on page for Dr. Silkworth. I want to say page XXIX. So, I don't know if that actually answered the question, but hopefully it will help with reflecting that as an individual, you know, if you feel that you are an alcoholic, according to the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The next question is slightly similar, but different, I would say. Am I an alcoholic if I can sometimes have a few drinks, but from time to time, I can't stop? Once that started, I can share what the big book suggested on that. Uh, I'm not a doctor, you know, so and, and definitely don't have any right or qualifications to diagnose anyone else, you know. Uh, but the hopeless state of mind and body comes to my mind. Uh, and it. Let me look at that question. Am I an alcoholic if I can sometimes have a few drinks, but from time to time, I can't stop once I've started. Uh, when it's said on page 30 to control and enjoy, that would be my question for that individual. Were you trying to control it? Uh, the big book addresses that for us. Um, you know, or if when you control it, are you enjoying it at the same time? Uh, for me, uh, that's not the case. But this and is a connector. It's saying control and enjoy. <laughs> and and this type of, this alcoholic here, <laughs> I I don't successfully do both at this simultaneously. If I'm trying to control it, uh, I'm not I'm not having a good time. <laughs> so I hope that helps uh, kind of drive that to where you could make that decision individually. I'm, okay. I'm not trying to cop out on that. I hope that doesn't sound like I'm looking for excuses, but I, I, I just know that this is something we've got to, like I said, on page 30, decide internally. The next question, why do they give so many examples of other people in the book of AA? Oh, what a good question. Why do they give so many examples of other people in the... Wow. Um, you guys are really coming up with great questions. Um, I I don't know the... Yeah. I You know, for me to go to the mind of Bill W., our co-founder, and Dr. Bob, it was their intent to write a volume. Matter of fact, 
that, and let me think where that is. I want to say, oh, I hope I'm right. There's a solution, maybe. It might be Dr. Silkworth. Um, hang on. There is a part. I'm not good at memorizing. That's why I, I'd much rather just let you know where it is. Okay, there's a solution. I believe that's where it would be. Hang on just a second. Um, where it discusses, here it is, page 19. Okay, it is, there is a solution. And what came to mind was, it says, we, meaning the original fellowship, capital F, we have concluded to publish an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it. So those examples could be that they were trying to really give plenty of information for you to review for yourself, you know, reflect on that. Because step one is a reflective step. And then it goes on to say, we shall bring to task our combined experience and knowledge. This should suggest a useful program for anyone concerned with a drinking problem. And then it also reminds me of that part that, yes, I have this problem. Yes, this program could work for me, too. And I believe maybe in the forward of one of the editions. I'm not positive about that part, but I, I recall seeing that in our literature. And I think that... Uh, I could just kind of give you a hypothetical that they were trying to give plenty of examples so we could relate and identify and find ourselves in this. And then if that's the case, from a hopeless state of mind and body, it would then at that point give us some hope that there is a suggested program of recovery. I hope that helps. Thank you. When was the last time you thought of alcohol? Today, in the meeting. Um, it, that's a, that's like a, such a valid, legitimate question. And, and the odd thing about that is as soon as I close my laptop, we're done with Zoom, I will not be thinking about it the rest of today. And the reason I say that is because as a part of the solution, I've identified the problem. And so to talk about the problem, I'm saying that alcohol is a symptom. Okay. We do have to get down to the causes and conditions. However, my symptoms showed up in the manifestation of the craving for alcohol, so I'm going to be discussing alcohol. And one thing I'd like to openly correct myself about that I used to believe that after the dash of step one, it was not discussed, alcohol was not discussed anymore, when in actuality it is in several very pertinent places, uh, the fifth step, the eighth step. Uh, or excuse me, ninth step, pardon me, the fifth step, the ninth step. Uh, and the fact that my purpose in life has completely changed. And so thinking about alcohol is not like um, something I just obsess about. So honestly, the last time I thought about it was just now. And then I'll think about it when I'm in another meeting because it, or working with others, perhaps, because this is something that I, I'm an alcoholic, and so my problem will manifest in those two powerless ways, not to mention the unmanageability. So it does, but I don't think about drinking. And if that was the um, spirit of the question, you know, like, am I thinking about drinking? Uh, no, I, I really do not. I can honestly say I'm free from that. And that is the arch that the book talks about. We walk through to freedom. So it takes some action to get there. So I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe that answers the next question in the term. What does the term recovered mean to you? Oh, good question. Uh, this is a part of what is used as the definition of the spiritual awakening or spiritual experience. Okay. Uh, it must be grounded in a power greater than ourselves follows that paragraph that we read in doctor's opinion, XXDIII, where it refers to the frothy emotional pill seldom suffices, but for these alcoholics being chronic like myself and relating to that, that the message, which is actually the book from the doctor's opinion to 164, that's the message, has to be grounded in a power greater than ourselves. And so in re referring to the word recovered, 
Okay, first of all, it's past tense, and I know that's kind of a grammatical, technical way of looking at it, but it is suggesting that I'm free. And the book talks about what I need in order to achieve that, and the spiritual experience, by definition, is the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. I, I hope that was uh, clear. I, I hope I didn't muddy that up with a bunch of words. <laughs> Not at all. Question six. With all our positive experiences in recovery and our life beyond our wildest dreams and the recognition and understanding of our alcoholism, why are we still not safe from the first drink? Okay. If I was living on life on life's terms for me, and, and that's really the perspective I come from. So I hope I make that, you know, I want to make sure that, um, you know, I, I say that as a preface uh, for me. Uh, okay. The word safe is mentioned on that page that I read, uh, 85, the top of 85. And so having done the action that's required throughout this uh, suggested program of recovery. Now, the pro I want to back up a moment. The su suggested program of recovery in and of itself is the spiritual program of action. That is a suggestion. However, the steps that it entails are not those actually, we do need to do those. That's what actually is the ingredients to recovery, okay? Uh, so two things come to mind. So when you say safe, I've worked the program from steps one up to step eight and nine, and then 85 is referring to a part of that 10th step. And when it says, we feel like we've been placed, and this is the key word for me, placed. I didn't do it. Somehow, somewhere, I was placed. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. And so that's a state of being for me. So wherever I go, this is a spiritual uh, way of living. It's not life on life's terms. I've accepted spiritual help, and I'm living on a spiritual basis. And it does suggest that those are difficult alternatives. But the key to that is that alternative means that there are two options in that situation. And by picking one, the other is rejected. Light switches is a good example. Pregnant, you know, either you are, or you aren't. When a light's off, it's off. When it's on, it's on. There's no in between. So when I accept spiritual help, I'm in this state that it talks about on page 85. And granted, receiving has been a problem for me all my life. So accepting spiritual help was definitely a dilemma for me. It really was. But once I started on that road of recovery, I can I can say that I am safe. Um, if it's referring to safe as far as the allergy, well, that defines me as the real alcoholic. That's not going to go away. As I mentioned uh, on page 30 when we were reading that, that it's important for me to remember when we were saying that that was the first step of recovery, step one. Well, it's important for me that as I reflect on that step, that I'm just as much an alcoholic today as I was the day before when I was drunk slobbering, you know, not pretty, <laughs> not a pretty picture. And I'm still just as much an alcoholic, but I do not suffer from the symptoms of alcohol. Okay, or alcoholism. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Question seven. Questions are coming in here. Did you find it easy to find your higher power? And did you have a spiritual belief before joining A? Wow, you guys are asking such terrific questions. Uh, easy is a elusive word because it's an experience over time. So there will be moments that I could share that I um, had 
awakenings. Like when I sleep at night, I set my clock and then I like to snooze it. And in the mornings, I'll do that five minute snooze and I'll even calculate my head. Ooh, I got five more minutes. And I attempt to go back to sleep with the intentions of not waking up. And here, the, I'm not snoozing. I'm actually waking up. I'm getting up, sitting up on the side of my bed. And I, I realize, oh, the blood's flowing. I, I have some needs. I need to go get coffee made. That is definitely a need. <laughs> and a few other things that come along with getting up in the mornings in my routine. And so when it says, was it easy to find your higher power? Uh, there were moments of awakening to his handprints in my life like I in in review of the past could see oh wow I see where that was a higher power that acted on my behalf you know did something for me uh when I sought him through beliefs as part of the question previous beliefs uh, I I did not find him in the sense that I can believe that he is on my side. He cares about me. He is uh, with me at all times. Um, the book talks about prejudice. And having had some time, 30-something years, it was real important that I ask myself before I just disregard spiritual terms, what do they really mean to me? And so, yes, to answer, I can really say I did have spiritual beliefs in sobriety, being separated from alcohol. They were even stronger because I thought, well, that's that's what's working. I, I don't you know, but the truth is the set aside prayer helped me tremendously with this question, being able to set that aside so I can have a new experience with God and everything else. So, yes, I did have prejudice. There were times that it was difficult when I would fight receiving. Okay. But if I would just allow the process to take its course in my life, trust the process. And it has been something that is life changing. It is transforming. And my higher power today is always present. I'm just not always aware of that. <laughs> so I, uh, that was a tough question. I hope I helped with that one. <laughs> you sure did. Okay, this is going to be the last one. Everybody just know, last question for the evening. Are meetings, service, etc., enough to maintain the spiritual experience? Well, uh, as a suggestion, uh, it it may vary. Okay, we all have different, as it was suggested in the big book, behavior patterns, and, and some of us might even be moderate drinkers, for all I know, right, or a hard drinker and can literally stop with maybe some difficulty, but still be able to stop. So in those situations, I, I'm not so sure. I don't know. Uh, but with meetings and service, for me, that's adamantly no, uh, because with the three legacies of the triangle, and that's touching on it, which is such a great question to the unity. That's where the perilous, the prescription and there is a solution on page 17 refers to both, not just the peril, which is the meetings, but also the solution, which is in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. So according to Alcoholics Anonymous in the big book that we're using here, the program that it's suggesting, that would be no, that we would need to have that third leg, which is recovery down at the bottom of that triangle. So service is a part of that. You've got unity, which is your meetings, but recovery is the third leg. I would hate to sit on a stool that needs to have three legs and I'm sitting on two. <laughs> I'm surely to fall. <laughs> oh, thank you, Renee. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.